Chapter six of Industrial Biography Ironworkers and Toolmakers by Samuel Smiles. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Clive Catterall. The Invention of Cast Steel. Benjamin Huntsman. It may be averred that as certainly as the age of iron superseded that of bronze, so will the age of steel reign triumphant over iron. Henry Bessemer. Aujourd'hui, la révolution qui devait amener en Grande-Bretagne la mémorable découverte de Benjamin Huntsman est tout à fait accomplie, et chaque jour les conséquences s'en feront plus vivement sentir sur le continent. Le play sur la fabrication de l'acier en Yorkshire. Iron, besides being used in various forms as bar and cast iron, is also used in various forms as bar and cast steel. And it is principally because of its many admirable qualities in these latter forms that iron maintains its supremacy over all other metals. The process of converting iron into steel had long been known among the eastern nations before it was introduced into Europe. The Hindus were especially skilled in the art of making steel, as indeed they are to this day. And it is supposed that the tools with which the Egyptians covered their obelisks and temples of porphyry and cyanite with hieroglyphics were made of Indian steel, as probably no other metal was capable of executing such work. The art seems to have been well known in Germany in the Middle Ages, and the process is on the whole very faithfully described by Agricola in his great work on metallurgy. England then produced very little steel, and was mainly dependent for its supply of the article upon the continental makers. From an early period Sheffield became distinguished for its manufacture of iron and steel into various useful articles. We find it mentioned in the thirteenth century as a place where the best arrowheads were made, the Earl of Richmond owing his success at the Battle of Bosworth partly to their superior length, sharpness, and finish. The manufactures of the town became of a more pacific character in the following centuries, during which knives, tools, and implements of husbandry became the leading articles. Chaucer's reference to the Sheffield Twittle, or case knife, in his Canterbury Tales, written about the end of the fourteenth century, shows that the place had become known for its manufacture of knives. In 1575 we find the Earl of Shrewsbury presenting his friend Lord Burley, a case of Hallamshire Whittles, being such fruits as his poor country affordeth with fame throughout the realm. Fuller afterwards speaks of the Sheffield knives as for common use of the country people, and he cites an instance of a knave who cozened him out of fourpence for one when it was only worth a penny. In 1600, Sheffield became celebrated for its tobacco boxes and Jews harps. The town was as yet of small size and population, for when a survey of it was made in 1615, it was found to contain not more than 2,207 householders, of whom one-third, or 725, were not able to live without the charity of their neighbours. These are all begging poor. It must, however, have continued its manufacture of knives, for we find that the knife with which Felton stabbed the Duke of Buckingham at Portsmouth in 1628 was traced to Sheffield. The knife was left sticking in the Duke's body, and when examined was found to bear the Sheffield Corporation mark. It was ultimately ascertained to have been made by one Wilde, a cutler, who had sold the knife for tenpence to Felton when recruiting in the town. At a still later period the manufacture of clasp or spring knives was introduced into Sheffield by Flemish workmen. Harrison says this trade was begun in 1650. The clasp knife was commonly known in the north as a jocteleg. Hence Burns, describing the famous article treasured by Captain Gross the antiquarian, says that it was a folding jocteleg of Langkale Gully, the word being merely a corruption of Jacques de Liège a famous foreign cutler, 
whose knives were as well known throughout Europe as those of Rogers or Mappin are now. Scythes and sickles formed other branches of manufacture introduced by the Flemish artisans, the makers of the former principally living in the parish of Norton, those of the latter in Eckington. Many improvements were introduced from time to time in the material of which these articles were made. Instead of importing the German steel, as it was called, the Sheffield manufacturers began to make it themselves, principally from Danamora iron imported from Sweden. The first English manufacturer of the article was one Crowley, a Newcastle man, and the Sheffield makers shortly followed his example. We may here briefly state that the ordinary method of preparing this valuable material of manufactures is by exposing iron bars placed in contact with roughly granulated charcoal to an intense heat, the process lasting for about a week, more or less, according to the degree of carbonization required. By this means what is called blistered steel is produced, and it furnishes the material out of which razors, files, knives, swords, and various articles of hardware are manufactured. A further process is the manufacture of the metal thus treated into sheer steel, by exposing a fasciculus of the blistered steel rods, with sand scattered over them for the purpose of a flux, to the heat of a wind furnace, until the whole mass becomes of a welding heat, when it is taken from the fire and drawn out under a forge hammer, the process of welding being repeated, after which the steel is reduced to the required sizes. The article called faggot steel is made after a somewhat similar process. But the most valuable form in which steel is now used in the manufactures of Sheffield is that of cast steel, in which iron is presented in perhaps its very highest state of perfection. Cast steel consists of iron united to carbon in an elastic state together with a small portion of oxygen whereas crude, or pig iron, consists of iron combined with carbon in a material state. Chief merits of cast steel consist in its possessing great cohesion and closeness of grain, with an astonishing degree of tenacity and flexibility, qualities which render it of the highest value in all kinds of tools and instruments, where durability, polish, and fineness of edge are essential requisites. It is to this material that we are mainly indebted for the exquisite cutting instrument of the surgeon, the chisel of the sculptor, the steel plate on which the engraver practices his art, the cutting tools employed in the various processes of skilled handicraft, down to the common saw or axe used by the backwoodsman in levelling the primeval forest. The invention of cast steel is due to Benjamin Huntsman of Attercliffe near Sheffield, M. Le Play, professor of metallurgy in the Royal School of Mines of France, after making careful inquiry and weighing all the evidence on the subject, arrived at the conclusion that the invention fairly belongs to Huntsman. The French professor speaks of it as a memorable discovery, made and applied with admirable perseverance, and he claims for its inventor the distinguished merit of advancing the steel manufactures of Yorkshire to the first rank and powerfully contributing to the establishment, on a firm foundation, of the industrial and commercial supremacy of Great Britain. It is remarkable that a French writer should have been among the first to direct public attention to the merits of this inventor, and to have first published the few facts known as to his history in a French government report, showing the neglect which men of this class have heretofore received at home and the much greater esteem in which they are held by scientific foreigners. Le Play, in his enthusiastic admiration of the discoverer of so potent a metal as cast steel, paid a visit to Huntsman's grave in Attercliffe Churchyard, near Sheffield, and from the inscription on his tombstone recites the facts of his birth, his death, and his brief history. With the assistance of his descendants, we are now enabled to add the following record of the life and labours of this remarkable, but almost forgotten man. Benjamin Huntsman was born in Lincolnshire in the year 1704. His parents were of German extraction, and had settled in this country only a few years previously to his birth. The boy, being of an ingenious turn, was bred to a mechanical calling 
and becoming celebrated for his expertness in repairing clocks, he eventually set up a business as a clockmaker and mender in the town of Doncaster. He also undertook various other kinds of metalwork, such as the making and repairing of locks, smoke jacks, roasting jacks, and other articles requiring mechanical skill. He was remarkably shrewd, observant, thoughtful, and practical. So much so that he came to be regarded as the wise man of his neighbourhood, and was not only consulted as the repairs of machinery, but also of the human frame. He practised surgery with dexterity, though after an empirical fashion, and was held in especial esteem as an oculist. His success was such that his advice was sought in many surgical diseases, and he was always ready to give it, but declined receiving any payment in return. In the exercise of his mechanical calling he introduced several improved tools, but was much hindered by the inferior quality of the metal supplied to him, which was common German steel. He also experienced considerable difficulty in finding a material suitable for the springs and pendulums of his clocks. These circumstances induced him to turn his attention to the making of a better kind of steel than was then procurable for the purposes of his trade. His first experiments were conducted at Doncaster, but as fuel was difficult to be had at that place, he determined, for great convenience, to remove to the neighbourhood of Sheffield, which he did in 1740. He first settled at Handsworth, a few miles to the south of that town, and there pursued his investigations in secret. Unfortunately, no records have been preserved of the methods which he adopted in overcoming the difficulties he had necessarily to encounter. That they must have been great is certain, for the process of manufacturing cast steel of a first-rate quality, even at this day, is of a most elaborate and delicate character, requiring to be carefully watched in its various stages. He had not only to discover the fuel and flux suitable for his purpose, but to build such a furnace and make such a crucible as should sustain a heat more intense than any then known to metallurgy. Ingot moulds had not yet been cast, nor were the hoops and wedges made that would hold them together, nor, in short, were any of those materials at his disposal which are now so familiar at every melting furnace. Huntsman's experiments extended over many years before the desired result was achieved. Long after his death, the memorials of the numerous failures, through which he toilsomely worked his way to success, were brought to light in the shape of many hundredweights of steel found buried in the earth in different places about his manufactory. From the number of these wrecks of early experiments, it is clear that he had worked continuously upon his grand idea of purifying the raw steel then in use, by melting it with fluxes at intense heat in closed earthen crucibles. The buried masses were found in various stages of failure, arising from imperfect melting, breaking of crucibles and bad fluxes, and had been hid away as so much spoiled steel of which nothing could be made. At last his perseverance was rewarded, and his invention perfected, and though a hundred years have passed since Huntsman's discovery, the description of fuel, coke, which he first applied for the purpose of melting steel, and the crucibles and furnaces which he used, are of the most part similar to those in use at the present day. Although the making of cast steel is conducted with greater economy and dexterity, owing to increased experience, it is questionable whether any maker has since been able to surpass the qualities of Huntsman's manufacture. The process of making cast steel, as invented by Benjamin Huntsman, may be thus summarily described. The melting is conducted in clay pots or crucibles manufactured for the purpose capable of holding about thirty-four pounds each. Ten or twelve of such crucibles are placed in a melting furnace, similar to that used by brass founders, and when the furnace and pots are at white heat, to which they are raised by a coke fire, they are charged with bar steel reduced to a certain degree of hardness, and broken into pieces about a pound each. When the pots are all thus charged with steel, lids are placed over them, and the furnace is filled with coke, and the cover put down. Under the intense heat to which the metal is exposed, 
it undergoes an apparent ebullition. When the furnace requires feeding, the workmen take the opportunity of lifting the lid of each crucible, and judging how far the process has advanced. After about three hours' exposure to the heat, the metal is ready for teeming. The completion of the melting process is known by the subsidence of all ebullition, and by the clear surface of the melted metal, which is of a dazzling brilliancy, like the sun when looked at with the naked eye upon a clear day. The pots are then lifted out of their place, and the liquid steel is poured into ingots of the shape and size required. The pots are replaced, filled again, and the process is repeated, the red-hot pots thus serving for three successive charges, after which they are rejected as useless. When Huntsman had perfected his invention, it would naturally occur to him that the new metal might be employed for other purposes besides clock-springs and pendulums. The business of clock-making was then of a very limited character, and it could scarcely have been worth his while to pursue so extensive and costly a series of experiments merely to supply the requirements of that trade. It is more probable that, at an early stage of his investigations, he shrewdly foresaw the extensive uses to which cast steel might be applied in the manufacture of tools and cutlery of a superior kind, and we accordingly find him early endeavouring to persuade the manufacturers of Sheffield to employ it in the manufacture of knives and razors. But the cutlers obstinately refused to work a material so much harder than that with which they were accustomed to use, and for a time he gave up all hopes of creating a demand in that quarter. Foiled in his endeavours to sell his steel at home, Huntsman turned his attention to foreign markets, and he soon found he could readily sell abroad all that he could make. The merit of employing cast steel for general purposes belongs to the French, always so quick to appreciate the advantages of any new discovery, and for a time the whole of the cast steel that Huntsman could manufacture was exported to France. When he had fairly established his business with that country, the Sheffield cutlers became alarmed at the reputation which cast steel was acquiring abroad, and when they heard of the preference displayed by English as well as French consumers for the cutlery manufactured of that metal, they readily apprehended the serious consequences that must necessarily result to their own trade if cast steel came into general use. They then appointed a deputation to wait upon Sir George Saville, one of the members for the county of York, and requested him to use his influence with the government to obtain an order to prohibit the exportation of cast steel. But on learning from the deputation that the Sheffield manufacturers themselves would not make use of the new steel, he positively declined to comply with their request. It was indeed fortunate for the interests of the town that the object of the deputation was defeated, for at that time Mr. Huntsman had very pressing and favourable offers from some spirited manufacturers in Birmingham to remove his furnaces to that place, and it is extremely probable that the business of cast steel-making becoming established there one of the most important and lucrative branches of its trade would have been lost to the town of Sheffield. The Sheffield makers were therefore under the necessity of using the cast steel if they would retain their trade in cutlery against France, and Huntsman's home trade rapidly increased. And then began the efforts of the Sheffield men to wrest his secret from him, for Huntsman had not taken out any patent for his invention his only protection being in preserving in his process as much mystery as possible. All the workmen employed by him were pledged to inviolable secrecy. Strangers were carefully excluded from his works, and the whole of the steel made was melted during the night. There were many speculations abroad as to Huntsman's process. It was generally believed that his secret consisted in the flux which he employed to make the metal melt more readily and it leaked out among the workmen that he used broken bottles for the purpose. Some of the manufacturers, who by prying and bribing got an inkling of the process, followed Huntsman implicitly in this respect, and they would not allow their own workmen to flux the pots, lest they also should obtain possession of the secret. But it turned out eventually that no such flux was necessary, and the practice has long since been discontinued. 
A Frenchman named Jarre, frequently quoted by Le Play in his account of the manufacture of steel in Yorkshire, paid a visit to Sheffield towards the end of the last century, and described the process so far as he was permitted to examine it. According to his statement, all kinds of fragments of broken steel were used, but this is corrected by Le Play, who states that only the best bar steel manufactured of Dannemora or iron was employed. Jarre adds that the steel is put into a crucible with a flux, the composition of which is kept secret, and he states that the time then occupied in the conversion was five hours. It is said that the person who first succeeded in copying Huntsman's process was an iron founder named Walker, who carried on his business at Greenside near Sheffield, and it was certainly there that the making of cast steel was next begun. Walker adopted the ruse of disguising himself as a tramp, and feigning great distress and abject poverty. He appeared shivering at the door of Huntsman's foundry late one night, when the workmen were about to begin their labours at steel-casting, and asked for admission to warm himself by the furnace fire. The workmen's hearts were moved, and they permitted him to enter. We have the above facts from the descendants of the Huntsman family, but we add the traditional story preserved in the neighbourhood, as given in a well-known book on metallurgy. One cold winter's night, while the snow was falling in heavy flakes, and the manufactory threw its red glared light over the neighbourhood, a person of the most abject appearance presented himself at the entrance, praying for permission to share the warmth and shelter which it afforded. The humane workman found the appeal irresistible, and the apparent beggar was permitted to take up his quarters in a warm corner of the building. A careful scrutiny would have discovered little real sleep in the drowsiness which seemed to overtake the stranger, for he eagerly watched every movement of the workmen while they went through the operations of the newly discovered process. He observed, first of all, the bars of blistered steel were broken into small pieces, two or three inches in length, and placed in crucibles of fire-clay. When nearly full, a little green glass, broken into small fragments, was spread over the top, and the whole covered with closely fitting cover. The crucibles were then placed in a furnace previously prepared for them, and after a lapse of from three to four hours, during which the crucibles were examined from time to time to see that the metal was thoroughly melted and incorporated, the workman proceeded to lift the crucible from its place on the furnace by means of tongs, and its molten contents, blazing, sparkling, and spurting, were poured into a mould of cast iron previously prepared. Here it was suffered to cool, while the crucibles were again filled and the process repeated. When cool, the mould was unscrewed, and a bar of cast steel presented itself, which only required the aid of a hammerman to form a finished bar of cast steel. How the unauthorised spectator of these operations effected his escape without detection, tradition does not say. But it tells us that before many months has passed, the Huntsman manufactory was not the only one where cast steel was produced. However the facts may be, the discovery of the elder Huntsman proved of the greatest advantage to Sheffield, for there is scarcely a civilised country where Sheffield steel is not largely used either in its most highly finished forms of cutlery, or as the raw material for home manufacture. In the meantime, the demand for Huntsman's steel steadily increased, and in 1770, for the purpose of obtaining greater scope of his operations, he removed to a large new manufactory, which he erected at Attercliffe, a little to the north of Sheffield, more conveniently situated for business purposes. There he continued to flourish for six years more, making steel and practising benevolence. For like the Darbys and Reynoldses of Colbrookdale, he was a worthy and highly respected member of the Society of Friends. He was well versed in the science of his day, and skilled in chemistry, which doubtless proved of great advantage to him in pursuing his experiments in metallurgy. That he was possessed of great perseverance will be obvious from the difficulties he encountered and overcame in perfecting his valuable invention. He was, however, like many persons of strong original character, eccentric in his habits, and reserved in his manner. 
the Royal Society wished to enrol him as a member in acknowledgment of the high merit of his discovery of cast steel, as well as because of his skill in practical chemistry. But as this would have drawn him in some measure from his seclusion, and was also, as he imagined, opposed to the principles of the society to which he belonged, he declined the honour. Mr. Huntsman died in 1776, in his seventy-second year, and was buried in the churchyard at Attercliffe, where a gravestone with an inscription marks his resting place. His son continued to carry on the business, and largely extended its operations. The Huntsman mark became known throughout the civilised world. Le Play, the French professor of metallurgy, in his memoir of 1846, still speaks of the cast steel bearing the mark of Huntsman and Marshall as the best that is made, and he adds, the buyer of this article, who pays a higher price for it than for other sorts, is not acting merely in the blind spirit of routine, but pays a logical and well-deserved homage to all the material and moral qualities of which the true Huntsman mark has been the guarantee for a century. Many other large firms now compete for their share of the trade, and the extent to which it has grown, the number of furnaces constantly at work, and the quantity of steel cast into ingots, to be tilted and rolled for the various purposes to which it is applied, have rendered Sheffield the greatest laboratory in the world for this valuable material. Of the total quantity of cast steel manufactured in England, not less than five-sixths are produced there, and the facilities for experiment and adaption on the spot have enabled the Sheffield steelmakers to keep the lead in the manufacture and surpass all others in the perfection to which they have carried this important branch of our national industry. It is indeed a remarkable fact that this very town, which was formerly indebted to Styria for the steel used in its manufactures, now exports a material of its own conversion to the Austrian forges and other places on the continent, from which it was before accustomed to draw its own supplies. Among the improved processes invented of late years for the manufacture of steel are those of Heath, Mushet, and Bessemer. The last promises to effect, before long, an entire revolution in the iron and steel trade. By it the crude metal is converted by one simple process, directly as it comes from the blast furnace. This is effected by driving through it, while still in a molten state, several streams of atmospheric air on which the carbon of the crude iron unites with the oxygen of the atmosphere, the temperature is greatly raised, and a violent ebullition takes place, during which, if the process be continued, that part of the carbon which appears to be mechanically mixed and diffused through the crude iron is entirely consumed. The metal becomes thoroughly cleansed, the slag is ejected and removed, while the sulphur and other volatile matters are driven off, the result being an ingot of malleable iron of the quality of charcoal iron. An important feature in the process is that by stopping it at a particular stage, immediately following the boil, before the whole of the carbon has been abstracted by the oxygen, the crude iron will be found to have passed into the condition of cast steel of ordinary quality. By continuing the process, the metal losing its carbon, it passes from hard to soft steel, thence to steely iron, and last of all to very soft iron, so that by interrupting the process at any stage, or continuing it to the end, almost any quality of iron and steel may be obtained. One of the most valuable forms of the metal is described by Mr. Bessemer as semi-steel, being in hardness about midway between ordinary cast steel and soft malleable iron. The Bessemer processes are now in full operation in England as well as abroad both for converting crude into malleable iron, and for producing steel, and the results are expected to prove of the greatest practical utility in all cases where iron and steel are extensively employed. Yet, like every other invention, this of Mr. Bessemer had long been dreamt of, if not really made. We are informed in Warner's tour through the northern counties of England, published at Bath in 1801, that a Mr. Reed of Whitehaven had succeeded at that early period in making steel directly from the ore, and Mr. Mushet clearly alludes to the process in his Papers on Iron and Steel. 
Nevertheless, Mr. Bessemer is entitled to the merit of working out the idea, and bringing the process to perfection by his great skill and indomitable perseverance. In the Heath process, carburet of manganese is employed to aid the conversion of iron into steel while it also confers on the metal the property of welding and working more soundly under the hammer, a fact discovered by Mr. Heath while residing in India. Mr. Mushet's process is of a similar character. Another inventor, Major Ocatius, an Austrian engineer, granulates crude iron while in a molten state by pouring it into water, and then subjecting it to the process of conversion. Some of the manufacturers still affect secrecy in their operations. But as one of the Sanderson firm, famous for the excellence of their steel, remarked to a visitor when showing him over their works, the great secret is to have the courage to be honest, a spirit to purchase the best material, and the means and disposition to do justice to it in the manufacture. It remains to be added that much of the success of the Sheffield manufacturers is attributable to the practical skill of the workmen, who have profited by the accumulated experience treasured up by their class through many generations. The results of the innumerable experiments conducted before their eyes have issued in a most valuable though unwritten code of practice, the details of which are known only to themselves. They are also a most laborious class, and Le Play says of them, when alluding to the fact of a single workman superintending the operations of three steel-casting furnaces, I have found nowhere in Europe except in England workmen able for an entire day, without any interval of rest, to undergo such toilsome and exhausting labour as that performed by these Sheffield workmen. End of chapter 6《ハイドラウィッシュの歴史》の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴史の歴 Sir Hugh Platt, 1589 Henry Court was born in 1740 at Lancaster, where his father carried on the trade for builder and brickmaker. Nothing is known as to Henry's early history, but he seems to have raised himself by his own efforts to a respectable position. In 1765 we find him established in Surrey Street, Strand, carrying on the business of a navy agent. In which he is said to have realized considerable profits. It was while conducting this business that he became aware of the inferiority of British iron compared with that obtained from foreign countries. The English wrought iron was considered so bad it was prohibited from all government supplies, while the cast iron was considered too brittle a nature to be suited for general use. Indeed, the Russian government became so persuaded that the English nation could not carry on their manufactures without Russian iron, that in 1770 they ordered the price to be raised from 70 and 80 kopecks per pood to 200 and 220 kopecks per pood. Such being the case, Court's attention became directed to the subject in connection with the supply of iron to the navy, and he entered on a series of experiments with the object of improving the manufacture of English iron. What the particular experiments were, and by what steps he arrived at results of so much importance to the British iron trade, no one can now tell. All that is known is that about the year 1775 he relinquished his business as a navy agent, and took a lease of certain premises at Fontley near Fareham, at the northwestern corner of Portsmouth Harbour, where he erected a forge and an iron mill. He was afterwards joined in partnership by Samuel Jellicoe, son of Adam Jellicoe, then deputy paymaster of Seaman's Wages, which turned out, as will shortly appear, a most unfortunate connection for court. 
As in the case of other inventions, Cort took up the manufacture of iron at the point to which his predecessors had brought it, carrying it still further and improving upon their processes. We may here briefly recite the steps by which the manufacture of bar iron by means of pit coal had up to this time been advanced. In 1747 Mr. Ford succeeded at Colebrookdale in smelting iron ore with pit coal, after which it was refined in the usual way by means of coke and charcoal. In 1762 Dr. Roebuck, hereafter to be referred to, took out a patent for melting the cast or pig iron in a hearth heated with pit-coal by the blast of bellows, and then working the iron until it was reduced to nature, or metallized, as it was then termed, after which it was exposed to the action of a hollow pit-coal fire urged by a blast, until it was reduced to a loop and drawn out into bar-iron under a common forge-hammer. Then the brothers Cranage, in 1766, adopted the reverberatory, or air-furnace, in which they placed the pig, or cast-iron, and without blast, or the addition of anything more than common raw pit-coal, converted the same into good malleable iron, which, being taken red-hot from the reverberatory furnace to the forge-hammer, was drawn into bars according to the will of the workman. Peter Onions of Merthyr Tydfil, in 1783, carried the manufacture a stage further, as described by him in his patent of that year. Having charged his furnace, bound with ironwork and well annealed, with pig or fused cast-iron from the smelting furnace. It was closed up, and the doors were looted with sand. The fire was urged by a blast admitted underneath, apparently for the purpose of keeping up the combustion of the fuel on the grate. Thus Onion's furnace was of the nature of a puddling furnace, the fire of which was urged by a blast. The fire was to be kept up until the metal became less fluid, and thickened into a kind of froth which the workman, by opening the door, must turn and stir with a bar or other iron instrument, and then close the aperture again, applying the blast and fire until there was a ferment in the metal. The patent further describes that, as the workman stirs the metal, the scoriae will separate, and the particles of iron will adhere, which particles the workman must collect or gather into a mass or lump. This mass or lump was then to be raised to a white heat, and forged into malleable iron at the forge-hammer. Such was the stage of advance reached in the manufacture of bar-iron when Henry Court published his patents in 1783 and 1784. In dispensing with a blast, he had been anticipated by the Cranages, and in the process of puddling by onions. But he introduced so many improvements of an original character, with which he combined the inventions of his predecessors, as to establish quite a new era in the history of the iron manufacture, and in the course of a few years to raise it to the highest state of prosperity. As early as 1786, Lord Sheffield recognised the great national importance of Court's improvements in the following words. If Mr. Court's very ingenious and meritorious improvements in the art of making and working iron, the steam engine of Bolton and Watt, and Lord Dundonald's discovery of making coke at half the present price should all succeed, it is not asserting too much to say that the result will be more advantageous to Great Britain than the possession of the thirteen colonies of America, for it will give the complete command of the iron trade to this country, with its vast advantages to navigation. It is scarcely necessary here to point out how completely the anticipations of Lord Sheffield have been fulfilled sanguine though they might appear to be when uttered some seventy-six years ago. We will endeavour, as briefly as possible, to point out the important character of Mr. Court's improvements, as embodied in his two patents of 1783 and 1784. In the first he states that, after great study, labour and expense in trying a variety of experiments and making many discoveries, he had invented and brought to perfection a peculiar method and process of preparing, welding, and working various sorts of iron, and reducing the same into uses by machinery, a furnace and other apparatus adapted and applied to the said process. He first describes his method of making iron for large uses, such as shanks, arms, rings, and palms of anchors, by the method of piling and faggoting 
since become generally practised, by laying bars of iron of suitable lengths forged on purpose, and tapering so as to be thinner at one end than the other, laid over one another in the manner of bricks in buildings, so that the ends should everywhere overlay each other. The faggots so prepared, to the amount of half a ton more or less, were then to be put into a common air or balling furnace, and brought to a welding heat, which was accomplished by his method in a much shorter time than in any hollow fire. And when the heat was perfect, the faggots were then brought under a forge hammer of great size and weight, and welded into a solid mass. Mr. Court alleges in the specification that iron, for larger uses, thus finished, is in all respects possessed of the highest degree of perfection, and that the fire in the balling furnace is better suited, from its regularity and penetrating quality, to give the iron a perfect welding heat throughout its whole mass, without fusing in any part, than any fire blown by a blast. Another process employed by Mr. Court for the purpose of cleansing the iron and producing a metal of purer grain was that of working the faggots by passing them through rollers. By this simple process, said he, all the earthy particles are pressed out, and the iron becomes at once free from dross, and what is usually called cinder, and is compressed into a fibrous and tough state. The objection has been taken to the process of passing the iron through rollers that the cinder is not so effectually got rid of as by passing it under a tilt hammer, and that much of it is squeezed into the bar and remains there, interrupting its fibre and impairing its strength. It does not appear that there was any novelty in the use of rollers by court, for in his first specification he speaks of them as already well known. His great merit consisted in apprehending the value of certain processes, as tested by his own and others' experience, and combining and applying them in a more effective practical form than had ever been done before. This power of apprehending the best methods, and embodying the details in one complete whole, marks the practical, clear-sighted man, and in certain cases amounts almost to a genius. The merit of combining the inventions of others in such forms as they shall work to advantage is as great in its way as the man who strikes out the inventions themselves, but who, for want of tact or experience, cannot carry them into a practical effect. It was the same with Court's second patent, in which he described his method of manufacturing bar iron from the ore or from cast iron. All the several processes therein described had been practised before his time, his merit chiefly consisting in the skilful manner in which he combined and applied them. Thus, like the Cranages, he employed the reverberatory or air furnace without blast, and like onions he worked the fused metal with iron bars until it was brought into lumps, when it was removed and forged into malleable iron. Court, however, carried the process further, and made it more effectual in all respects. His method may be thus briefly described. The bottom of the reverberatory furnace was hollow, so as to contain the fluid metal, introduced into it by ladles, the heat being kept up by pit coal or other fuel. When the furnace was charged, the doors were closed until the metal was sufficiently fused. When the workman opened an aperture, and worked or stirred about the metal with iron bars, when an ebullition took place, during the continuance of which a bluish flame was emitted, the carbon of the cast iron was burned off, the metal separated from the slag, and the iron, becoming reduced to nature, was then collected into lumps or loops of sizes suited to their intended uses, when they were drawn out of the doors of the furnace. They were then stamped into plates, and piled or worked in an air furnace, heated to a white or welding heat, shingled under a forge-hammer, and pressed through the grooved rollers after the method described in the first patent. The processes described by Court in his two patents have been followed by iron manufacturers with various modifications, the results of enlarged experience, down to the present time. After the lapse of seventy-eight years, the language employed by Court continues, on the whole, a faithful description of the processes still practised. The same methods of manufacturing bar from cast iron, 
and of puddling, piling, welding, and working the bar iron through grooved rollers. All are nearly identical with the methods of manufacture perfected by Henry Court in 1784. It may be mentioned that the development of the powers of the steam engine by Watt had an extraordinary effect upon the production of iron. It created a largely increased demand for the article for the purposes of the shafting and machinery which it was employed to drive, while at the same time it cleared pits of water which before were unworkable, and by being extensively applied to the blowing of iron furnaces and the working of the rolling mills, it thus gave a still further impetus to the manufacture of the metal. It would be beside our purpose to enter into any statistical detail on the subject, but it will be sufficient to state that the production of iron, which in the early part of last century amounted to little more than 12,000 tonnes, about the middle of the century to about 18,000 tonnes, and at the time of Court's inventions to about 90,000 tonnes, was found in 1820 to have increased to 400,000 tonnes. And now the total quantity produced is upwards of four millions of tons of pig iron every year, or more than the entire production of all other European countries. There is little reason to doubt that this extraordinary development of the iron manufacture has been in a great measure due to the inventions of Henry Court. It is said that at the present time there are not fewer than 8,200 of Court's furnaces in operation in Great Britain alone. Practical men have regarded Court's improvement of the process of rolling the iron as the most valuable of his inventions. A competent authority has spoken of Court's grooved rollers as of high philosophical interest, being scarcely less than the discovery of a new mechanical power in reversing the action of the wedge by the application of force to four surfaces so as to elongate a mass, instead of applying force to a mass to divide the four surfaces. One of the best authorities in the iron trade of last century, Mr. Alexander Rabbi of Llanethley, like many others, was at first entirely sceptical as to the value of Court's invention. But he had no sooner witnessed the process than with manly candour he avowed his entire conversion to his views. We now return to the history of the chief author of this great branch of national industry. As might naturally be expected, the principal ironmasters, when they heard of Court's success, and the rapidity and economy with which he manufactured and forged bar iron, visited his foundry for the purpose of examining his process, and, if found expedient, of employing it at their own works. Among the first to try it were Richard Crawshay of Cafartha, Samuel Homfray of Penny Durren, both in South Wales, and William Reynolds of Colbrookdale. Richard Crawshay was then, in 1787, forging only ten tons of bar iron weekly under the hammer, and when he saw the superior processes invented by Court, he readily entered into a contract with him to work under his patents at ten shillings a ton royalty. In 1812, a letter from Mr. Crawshay to the Secretary of Lord Sheffield was read to the House of Commons, descriptive of his method of working iron, in which he said, I took it from a Mr. Court, who had a little mill at Fontley in Hampshire. I have thus acquainted you with my method, by which I am now making more than ten thousand tons of bar iron per annum. Samuel Homfray was equally prompt in adopting the new process. He not only obtained from Court plans of the puddling furnaces and patterns for the rolls, but borrowed Court's workmen to instruct his own in the necessary operations and he soon found the method so superior to that invented by onions that he entirely confined himself to manufacture after Court's patent. We also find Mr. Reynolds inviting Court to conduct a trial of his process at Ketley, though it does not appear that it was adopted by the firm at that time. The quality of the iron manufactured by the new process was found satisfactory, and the Admiralty having by the persons appointed by them to test it in 1787, pronounced it to be superior to the best Orgrand's iron. The use of the latter was thenceforward discontinued, and Court's iron only was directed to be used for the anchors and other ironwork in the ships of the Royal Navy. The merits of the invention seem to have been generally conceded, 
and numerous contracts for licenses were entered into with Court and his partner by the manufacturers of bar iron throughout the country. Court himself made arrangements for carrying on the manufacture on a large scale, and with that object entered upon the possession of a wharf at Gosport belonging to Adam Jellicoe, his partner's father, where he succeeded in obtaining considerable government orders for iron made after his patents. To all ordinary eyes, the inventor now appeared to be on the high road to fortune. But there was a fatal canker at the root of this seeming prosperity, and in a few years the fabric which he had so laboriously raised crumbled into ruins. On the death of Adam Jellicoe, the father of Court's partner, in August 1789, defalcations were discovered in his public accounts to the extent of thirty-nine thousand six hundred and seventy-six pounds, and his books and papers were immediately taken possession of by the government. On examination, it was found that the debts due to Jellicoe amounted to eighty-nine thousand six hundred and fifty-seven pounds, included in which was a sum of not less than fifty-four thousand eight hundred and fifty-three pounds owing to him by the court partnership. In the public investigation which afterwards took place, it appeared that the capital possessed by court being insufficient to enable him to pursue his experiments, which were of a very expensive character, Adam Jellicoe had advanced money from time to time for the purpose, securing himself by a deed of agreement entitling him to one half of the stock and profits of all his contracts and in further consideration of the capital advanced by Jellicoe beyond his equal share, Court subsequently assigned to him all his patent rights as collateral security. As Jellicoe had the reputation of being a rich man, Court had not the slightest suspicion of the source from which he obtained the advances made by him to the firm. Nor has any connivance whatever on the part of Court been suggested. At the same time, it must be admitted that the connection was not free from suspicion, and to say the least, it was a singularly unfortunate one. It was found that among the monies advanced by Jellicoe to court, there was a sum of £27,500 entrusted to him for the payment of seamen's and officers' wages. How his embarrassments had tempted him to make use of the public funds for the purpose of carrying on his speculations appears from his own admissions. In a memorandum dated the 11th of November, 1782, found in his strong-box after his death, he set forth that he had always had much more than his proper balance in hand, until his engagement, about two years before, with Mr. Court, which by degrees has so reduced me, and employed so much more of my money than I expected, that I have been obliged to turn most of my navy bills into cash and at the same time, to my great concern, am very deficient in my balance. This gives me great uneasiness, nor shall I live or die in peace till the whole is restored. He had, however, made the first false step, after which the downhill career of dishonesty is rapid. His desperate attempts to set himself right only involved him the deeper. His conscious breach of trust caused him a degree of daily torment which he could not bear, and the discovery of his defalcations, which was made only a few days before his death, doubtless hastened his end. The government acted with promptitude, as they were bound to do in such a case. The body of Jellicoe was worth nothing to them, but they could secure the property in which he had fraudulently invested the public monies entrusted to him. With this object, the then paymaster of the navy proceeded to make an affidavit in the Royal Exchequer that Henry Court was indebted to His Majesty in the sum of £27,500 and upwards. In respect of monies belonging to the public treasury, which Adam Jellicoe had at different times lent an advance to the said Henry Court, from whom the same now remains justly due and owing, and the deponent saith he verily believes that the said Henry Court is much decayed in his credit, and in very embarrassed circumstances. And therefore the deponent verily believes that the aforesaid debt so due and owing to his majesty is in great danger of being lost 
if some more speedy means be not taken for the recovery than by the ordinary process of the court. Extraordinary measures were therefore adopted. The assignments of court's patents, which had been made to Jellicoe in consideration of his advances, were taken possession of. But Samuel Jellicoe, the son of the defaulter, singular to say, was put in possession of the properties at Fontley and Gosport, and continued to enjoy them, to court's exclusion, for a period of fourteen years. It does not, however, appear that any patent right was ever levied by the assignees, and the result of the proceeding was that the whole benefit of court's inventions was thus made over to the ironmasters and to the public. Had the estate been properly handled, and the patent rights due under the contracts made by the ironmasters with court been duly levied, there is little reason to doubt that the whole of the debt owing to the government would have been paid in the course of a few years. When we consider, says Mr. Webster, how very simple was the process of demanding of the contracting ironmasters the patent due, which for the year 1789 amounted to £15,000, 1790 to £15,000, and in 1791 to £25,000, and which demand might have been enforced by the same legal process used to ruin the inventor, it is not difficult to surmise the motive for abstaining. The case, however, was not so simple as Mr. Webster puts it, for there was such a contingency as that of the ironmasters combining to dispute the patent right, and there is every reason to believe that they were prepared to adopt that course. Although the court patents expired in 1796 and 1798 respectively, they continued the subject of public discussions for some time after more particularly in connection with the defalcations of the deceased Adam Jellicoe. It does not appear that more than £2,654 was realised by the government from the court estate, towards the loss sustained by the public, as a balance of £24,846 was still found standing to the debit of Jellicoe in 1800, when the deficiencies in the naval accounts became matter of public inquiry. A few years later, in 1805, the subject was again revived in a remarkable manner. In that year, the Whigs, perceiving the bodily decay of Mr. Pitt, and being too eager to wait for his removal by death, began their famous series of attacks upon his administration. Fearing to tackle the popular statesman himself, they inverted the ordinary tactics of the opposition, and fell foul of Dundas, Lord Melville, then Treasurer of the Navy who had successfully carried the country through the great naval war with revolutionary France. They scrupled not to tax him with gross speculation, and exhibited articles of impeachment against him, which became the subject of elaborate investigation, the result of which is a matter of history. In those articles no reference whatever was made to Lord Melville's supposed complicity with Jellicoe, nor, on the trial that followed, was any reference made to the defalcations of that official. But when Mr. Whitbread, on the 8th of April, 1805, spoke to the resolutions in the Commons for impeaching the Treasurer of the Navy, he thought proper to intimate that he had a strong suspicion that Jellicoe was in the same partnership with Mark Sprott, Alexander Trotter, and Lord Melville. He had been suffered to remain a public debtor for a whole year after he was known to be in arrears upwards of £24,000. During the next year, £11,000 more had accrued. It would not have been fair to have turned too short on an old companion. It would, perhaps, too, have been dangerous, since unpleasant discoveries might have met the public eye. It looked very much as if, mutually conscious of criminality, they had agreed to be silent and keep their own secrets. In making these offensive observations, Whitbread was manifestly actuated by political enmity. They were utterly unwarrantable. In the first place, Melville had been formally acquitted of Jellicoe's deficiency by a writ of privy seal, dated 31st of May, 1800. And secondly, the committee appointed in that very year, 1805, to reinvestigate the naval accounts, had again exonerated him, but intimated that they were of opinion there was remissness on his part 
in allowing Jellicoe to remain in his office after the discovery of his defalcations. In the report made by the commissioners to the Houses of Parliament in 1805, the value of court's patents was estimated at only one hundred pounds. Referring to the schedule of Jellicoe's alleged assets, they say, Many of the debts are marked as bad, and we apprehended that the debt from Mr. Henry Court, not so marked, of fifty-four thousand pounds and upwards, is of that description. As for poor bankrupt Henry Court, these discussions availed nothing. On the death of Jellicoe, he left his ironworks, feeling himself a ruined man. He made many appeals to the government of the day for restoral of his patents and offered to find security for payment of the debt due by his firm to the crown, but in vain. In 1794 an appeal was made to Mr. Pitt by a number of influential members of Parliament, on behalf of the inventor and his destitute family of twelve children, when a pension of two hundred pounds a year was granted him. This Mr. Court enjoyed until the year 1800, when he died, broken in health and in spirit, and in his sixtieth year. He was buried in Hampstead Churchyard, where a stone marking the date of his death is still to be seen. A few years since it was illegible, but it has recently been restored by his surviving son. Though Court thus died in comparative poverty, he laid the foundations of many gigantic fortunes. He may be said to have been in a great measure the author of our modern iron aristocracy, who still manufacture after the processes which he invented or perfected, but for which they never paid him a shilling of royalty. These men of gigantic fortunes have owed much, we might almost say everything, to the ruined projector of the little mill at Fontley. Their wealth has enriched many families of the older aristocracy, and has been the foundation of several modern peerages. Yet Henry Court, the rock from which they were hewn is already all but forgotten, and his surviving children, now aged and infirm, are dependent for their support upon the slender pittance wrung by repeated entreaty and expostulation from the state. The career of Richard Crawshay, the first of the great ironmasters who had the sense to appreciate and adopt the methods of manufacturing iron invented by Henry Court, is a not unfitting commentary on the sad history we have thus briefly described. It shows how, as respects mere money-making, shrewdness is more potent than invention, and business faculty than manufacturing skill. Richard Crawshay was born near Normanton, near Leeds, the son of a small Yorkshire farmer. When a youth he worked on his father's farm, and looked forward to occupying the same condition in life but a difference with his father unsettled his mind, and at the age of fifteen he determined to leave his home and seek his fortune elsewhere. Like most unsettled and enterprising lads, he first made for London, riding to town on a pony of his own, which, with the clothes on his back, formed his entire fortune. It took him a fortnight to make the journey, in consequence of the badness of the roads. Arrived in London, he sold his pony for fifteen pounds, and the money kept him until he succeeded in finding employment. He was so fortunate as to be taken upon trial by a Mr. Bicklewith, who kept an ironmonger's shop in York Yard, Upper Thames Street, and his first duty there was to clean out the office, put the stools and desks in order for the other clerks, run errands, and act as porter when occasion required. Young Crawshay was very attentive, industrious, and shrewd and became known in the office as the Yorkshire Boy. Chiefly because of his cuteness, his master appointed him to the department of selling flat-irons. The London washerwomen of that day were very sharp and not very honest, and it used to be said of them that where they bought one flat-iron they generally contrived to steal two. Mr. Bicklewith thought he could do no better than set the Yorkshireman to watch the washerwomen, and by way of inducement to him to be vigilant, he gave young Crawshay an interest in that branch of the business, which was soon found to prosper under his charge. After a few more years Mr. Bicklewith retired, and left to Crawshay the cast-iron business in York Yard. This he still further increased, 
There was not, at that time, much enterprise in the iron trade, but Crawshay endeavoured to connect himself with what there was of it. The price of iron was then very high, and the best sorts were still imported from abroad. A good deal of the foreign iron and steel being still landed at the steel-yard on the Thames, in the immediate neighbourhood of Crawshay's ironmongery store. It seems to have occurred to some London capitalists that money was then to be made in the iron trade, and that South Wales was a good field for an experiment. The soil there was known to be full of coal and ironstone, and several small ironworks had for some time been carried on, which were supposed to be doing well. Merthyr Tydfil was one of the places at which operations had been begun, but the place being situated in a hill district of difficult access, and the manufacture being still in a very imperfect state, the progress made was for some time very slow. Land containing coal and iron was deemed of very little value, as may be inferred from the fact that in the year 1765 Mr. Anthony Bacon, a man of much foresight, took a lease from Lord Talbot for ninety-nine years of the minerals under forty square miles of country surrounding the then insignificant hamlet of Merthyr Tydfil, at the trifling rental of two hundred pounds a year. There he erected ironworks, and supplied the government with considerable quantities of cannon and iron for different purposes. And having earned a competency, he retired from business in 1782, subletting his mineral tract in four divisions, the Dowlais, the Penny Darren, the Caffartha, and the Plymouth Works, north, east, west, and south of Merthyr Tedville. Mr. Richard Crawshay became the lessee of what Mr. Mushet has called the Caffartha Flitch of the Great Bacon Domain. There he proceeded to carry on the works established by Mr. Bacon with increased spirit. His son William, whom he left in charge of the ironmongery store in London, supplying him with capital to put into the ironworks as fast as he could earn it by the retail trade. In 1787 we find Richard Crawshay manufacturing with difficulty ten tons of bar iron weekly, and it was of a very inferior character, the means not having been yet devised at Kefartha for malleabilizing the pit-coal cast iron with economy or good effect. Yet Crawshay found a ready market for all the iron he could make and he is said to have counted the gains of the forge-hammer close by his house at the rate of a penny a stroke. In the course of time he found it necessary to erect new furnaces, and, having adopted the processes invented by Henry Court, he was thereby enabled greatly to increase the production of his forges, until in 1812 we find him stating to a committee of the House of Commons that he was making ten thousand tons of bar iron yearly, or an average produce of two hundred tons a week. But this quantity, great though it was, has since been largely increased, the total produce of the Crawshay furnaces at Caffartha, Innisfach and Kerwin, being upwards of fifty thousand tons of bar iron yearly. The distance of Merthyr from Cardiff, the nearest port, being considerable, and the cost of carriage being very great by reason of the badness of the roads, Mr. Crawshay set himself to overcome this great impediment to the prosperity of the Merthyr Tedfil district, and in conjunction with Mr. Homfrey of the Penny Darren Works, he planned and constructed the canal to Cardiff, the opening of which, in 1795, gave an immense impetus to the iron trade of the neighbourhood. Numerous other extensive ironworks became established there, until Merthyr Tedville attained the reputation of being at once the richest and the dirtiest district in all Britain. Mr. Crawshay became known in the west of England as the Iron King, and was quoted as the highest authority in all questions relating to the trade. Mr. George Crawshay, recently describing the founder of the family at a social meeting at Newcastle, said, In these days a name like ours is lost in the infinity of great manufacturing firms which exist throughout our land. But in those early times, the man who opened out the iron district of Wales stood upon an eminence seen by all in the world. It is preserved in the traditions of the family that when the Iron King used to drive from home in his coach and four into Wales, all the country turned out to see him, and quite a commotion took place when he passed through Bristol on his way to the works. My great-grandfather was succeeded by his son and by his grandson, 
The Crawshies have followed one another for four generations in the iron trade in Wales, and there they still stand at the head of the trade. The occasion on which these words were uttered was at a Christmas party given to the men, about thirteen hundred in number, employed at the ironworks of Messrs. Hawkes, Crawshie and Company at Newcastle upon Tyne. These works were founded in 1754 by William Hawkes, a blacksmith, whose principal trade consisted in making claw hammers for joiners. He became a thriving man and eventually a large manufacturer of bar iron. Partners joined him, and in the course of the changes wrought by time, one of the Crawshies, in 1842, became a principal partner in the firm. Illustrations of a like kind might be multiplied to any extent, showing the growth in our time of an iron aristocracy of great wealth and influence, the result mainly of the successful working of the inventions of the unfortunate and unrequited Henry Court. He has been the very Tubal Cain of England, one of the principal founders of our Iron Age. To him we mainly owe the abundance of wrought iron for machinery, for steam engines and for railways, at one-third the price we were before accustomed to pay to the foreigner. We have, by his invention, not only ceased to be dependent upon other nations for our supply of iron for tools, implements and arms, but we have become the greatest exporters of iron, producing more than all other European countries combined. In the opinion of Mr. Fairburn of Manchester, the inventions of Henry Court have already added six hundred million sterling to the wealth of the kingdom, while they have given employment to some six hundred thousand working people during three generations. And while the great ironmasters, by freely availing themselves of his inventions, have been adding estate to estate, the only estate secured by Henry Court was the little domain of six feet by two in which he lies interred in Hampstead Churchyard. End of chapter 7「VIII of Industrial Biography – Iron Workers and Toolmakers – by Samuel Smiles – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Clive Catterall – The Scotch Iron Manufacture – Dr. Roebuck – David Mushet Were public benefactors to be allowed to pass away like hewers of wood and drawers of water without commemoration? genius and enterprise would be deprived of their most coveted distinction. Sir Henry Englefield The account given of Dr. Roebuck in a Cyclopedia of Biography recently published in Glasgow runs as follows. Roebuck, John, a physician and experimental chemist, born at Sheffield, 1718, died after ruining himself by his projects, 1794. Such is the short shrift which the man receives who fails. Had Dr. Roebuck wholly succeeded in his projects, he would probably have been esteemed as among the greatest of Scotland's benefactors. Yet his life was not altogether a failure, as we think will sufficiently appear from the following brief account of his labours. At the beginning of the last century, John Roebuck's father carried on the manufacture of cutlery at Sheffield in the course of which he realised a competency. He intended his son to follow his own business, but the youth was irresistibly attracted to scientific pursuits, in which his father liberally encouraged him, and he was placed first under the care of Dr. Doddridge at Northampton, and afterwards at the University of Edinburgh, where he applied himself to the study of medicine, and especially of chemistry, which was then attracting considerable attention at the principal seats of learning in Scotland. While residing at Edinburgh, young Roebuck contracted many intimate friendships with men who afterwards became eminent in literature, such as Hume and Robertson, the historians, and the circumstance is supposed to have contributed not a little to his partiality in favour of Scotland, and his afterwards selecting it as the field for his industrial operations. After graduating as a physician at Leyden, Roebuck returned to England, and settled at Birmingham in the year 1745, for the purpose of practising his profession. 
Birmingham was then a principal seat of the metal manufacture, and its mechanics were reputed to be among the most skilled in Britain. Dr. Roebuck's attention was early drawn to the scarcity and dearness of the material in which the mechanics worked, and he sought, by experiment, to devise some method of smelting iron otherwise than by means of charcoal. He had a laboratory fitted up in his house for the purpose of prosecuting his inquiries, and there he spent every minute that he could spare from his professional labours. It was thus that he invented the process of smelting iron by means of pit coal, which he afterwards embodied in the patent hereafter to be referred to. And at the same time he invented new methods of refining gold and silver, and of employing them in the arts, which proved of great practical value to the Birmingham tradesmen, who made extensive use of them in their various processes of manufacture. Dr. Roebuck's inquiries had an almost exclusively practical direction, and in pursuing them his main object was to render them subservient to the improvement of the industrial arts. Thus he sought to devise more economical methods of producing the various chemicals used in the Birmingham trade, such as ammonia, sublimate, and several of the acids, and his success was such as to induce him to erect a large laboratory for their manufacture which was conducted with complete success by his friend Mr. Garbett. Among his inventions of this character was the modern process of manufacturing vitriolic acid in leaden vessels in large quantities, instead of in glass vessels in small quantities, as formerly practised. His success led him to consider the project of establishing a manufactory for the purpose of producing oil of vitriol on a large scale, and having given up his practice as a physician, he resolved with his partner Mr. Garbett, to establish the proposed works in the neighbourhood of Edinburgh. He removed to Scotland with that object, and began the manufacture of vitriol at Prestopans in the year 1749. The enterprise proved eminently lucrative, and encouraged by his success, Roebuck proceeded to strike out new branches of manufacture. He started a pottery for making white and brown ware, which eventually became established and the manufacture exists in the same neighbourhood to this day. The next enterprise in which he became engaged was one of still greater importance, though it proved eminently unfortunate in its results as concerned himself. While living at Prestopans, he made the friendship of Mr. William Cadell of Cockenzie, a gentleman who had for some time been earnestly intent on developing the industry of Scotland, then in a very backward condition. Mr. Cadell had tried, without success, to establish a manufactory of iron, and though he had heretofore failed, he hoped that with the aid of Dr. Roebuck he might yet succeed. The doctor listened to his suggestions with interest, and embraced the proposed enterprise with zeal. He immediately proceeded to organise a company in which he was joined by a number of his friends and relatives. His next step was to select a site for the intended works and make the necessary arrangements for beginning the manufacture of iron. After carefully examining the country on both sides of the Forth, he at length made a choice of a site on the banks of the river Carron, in Stirlingshire, where there was an abundant supply of water, and an inexhaustible supply of iron, coal, and limestone in the immediate neighbourhood, and there Dr. Roebuck planted the first ironworks in Scotland. In order to carry them on with the best chances of success, he brought a large number of skilled workmen from England, who formed a nucleus of industry at Carron, where their example and improved methods of working served to train the native labourers in their art. At a subsequent period, Mr. Cadell of Carron Park also brought a number of skilled English nail-makers into Scotland, and settled them in the village of Camelon, where, by teaching others, the business has become handed down to the present day. The first furnace was blown at Carron on the first day of January, 1760, and in the course of the same year the Carron ironworks turned out 1,500 tons of iron, then the whole annual produce of Scotland. Other furnaces were shortly after erected on improved plans, and the production steadily increased. Dr. Roebuck was indefatigable in his endeavours to improve the manufacture, and he was one of the first, as we have said, to revive the use of pit-coal in refining the ore, as appears from his patent of 1762. 
He there describes his new process as follows. I melt pig, or any kind of cast iron, in a hearth heated with pit-coal by the blast of bellows, and work the metal until it is reduced to nature, which I take out of the fire and separate to pieces. Then I take the metal thus reduced to nature, and expose it to the action of a hollow pit-coal fire, heated by the blast of bellows until it is reduced to a loop, which I draw out under a common forge-hammer into bar-iron. This method of manufacture was followed with success, though for some time, as indeed to this day, the principal production of the Carron ironworks was castings, for which the peculiar quality of the Scotch iron admirably adapts it. The well-known Carronades, or smashers, as they were named, were cast in large numbers at the Carron ironworks. To increase the power of his blowing apparatus, Dr. Roebuck called to his aid the celebrated Mr. Smeaton, the engineer, who contrived and erected for him at Carron the most perfect apparatus of the kind then in existence. It may also be added that out of the Carron enterprise, in a great measure, sprang the Forth and Clyde Canal, the first artificial navigation in Scotland. The Carron Company, with a view to securing an improved communication with Glasgow, themselves surveyed a line which was only given up in consequence of the determined opposition of the landowners. But the project was again revived through their means, and was eventually carried out after the designs of Smeaton and Brindley. While the Carron foundry was pursuing a career of safe prosperity, Dr. Roebuck's enterprise led him to embark in coal mining, with the object of securing an improved supply of fuel for the ironworks. He became the lessee of the Duke of Hamilton's extensive coal mines at Burrowstoneness, as well as of the salt pans which were connected with them. The mansion of Keneal went with the lease, and there Dr. Roebuck and his family took up their abode. Keneal House was formerly a country seat of the Dukes of Hamilton, and to this day a stately old mansion, reminding one of a French chateau. Its situation is of remarkable beauty, its windows overlooking the broad expanse of the Firth of Forth, and commanding an extensive view of the country along its northern shores. The place has become in a measure classical, Keneal House having been inhabited since Dr. Roebuck's time by Dugald Stewart, who there wrote his philosophical essays. When Dr. Roebuck began to sink for coal at the new mines, he found it necessary to erect pumping machinery of the most powerful kind that could be contrived, in order to keep the mines clear of water. For this purpose the Newcomen engine, in its then state, was found insufficient, and when Dr. Roebuck's friend, Professor Black of Edinburgh, informed him of a young man of his acquaintance, a mathematical instrument maker at Glasgow, having invented a steam engine calculated to work with increased power, speed and economy compared with Newcomen's. Dr. Roebuck was much interested, and shortly after entered into a correspondence with James Watt, the mathematical instrument maker aforesaid, on the subject. The doctor urged that Watt, who up to that time had confined himself to models, should come over to Keneal House and proceed to erect a working engine in one of the outbuildings. The English workmen whom he had brought to the Carron works would, he justly thought, give Watt a better chance of success with his engine than if made by the clumsy whitesmiths and blacksmiths of Glasgow, quite unaccustomed as they were to first-class work. And he proposed himself to cast the cylinders at Carron, previous to Watt's intended visit to him at Keneal. Watt paid his promised visit in May 1768, and Roebuck was by this time so much interested in the invention that the subject of his becoming a partner with Watt, with the subject of introducing the engine into general use, was seriously discussed. Watt had been labouring at his invention for several years, contending with many difficulties, but especially the main difficulty of limited means. He had borrowed considerable sums of money from Dr. Black to enable him to prosecute his experiments, and he felt the debt to hang like a millstone round his neck. Watt was a sickly, fragile man, and a constant sufferer from violent headaches. Besides, he was by nature timid, desponding, painfully anxious, and easily cast down by failure. Indeed, he was more than once on the point of abandoning his invention in despair. On the other hand, Dr. Roebuck was accustomed to great enterprises, a bold and undaunted man, 
and disregardful of expense when he saw before him a reasonable prospect of success. His reputation as a practical chemist and philosopher, and his success as the founder of the Prestepans chemical works and of the Caron ironworks, justified the friends of Watt in thinking that he was, of all men, the best calculated to help him at this juncture, and hence they sought to bring about a more intimate connection between the two. The result was that Dr. Roebuck eventually became a partner to the extent of two-thirds of the invention, took upon him the debt owing by Watt to Dr. Black, amounting to about £1,200, and undertook to find the requisite money to protect the invention by means of a patent. The necessary steps were taken accordingly, and the patent right was secured by the beginning of 1769, though the perfecting of his model cost Watt much further anxiety and study. It was necessary for Watt occasionally to reside with Dr. Roebuck at Kinneil House while erecting his first engine there. It had been originally intended to erect it in the neighbouring town of Boristoness, but as there might be prying eyes there, and Watt wished to do his work in privacy, determined not to puff, he at length fixed upon an outhouse, still standing, close behind the mansion, by the burnside in the glen, where there was an abundance of water and secure privacy. Watt's extreme diffidence was often the subject of remark at Dr. Roebuck's fireside. To the doctor his anxiety seemed quite painful, and he was very much disposed to despond under the apparently trivial difficulties. Roebuck's hopeful nature was his mainstay throughout. Watt himself was ready enough to admit this, for, writing to his friend Dr. Small, he once said, I have met with many disappointments, and I must have sunk under the burden of them if I had not been supported by the friendship of Dr. Roebuck. But more serious troubles were rapidly accumulating upon Dr. Roebuck himself, and it was he, and not Watt, that sank under the burden. The progress of Watt's engine was but slow, and long before it could be applied to the pumping of Roebuck's mines, the difficulties of the undertaking on which he had entered into overwhelmed him. The opening out of the principal coal involved a very heavy outlay, extending over many years, during which he sank not only his own but his wife's fortune and, what distressed him most of all, large sums borrowed from his relatives and friends, which he was unable to repay. The consequence was that he was eventually under the necessity of withdrawing his capital from the refining works at Birmingham and the vitriol works at Prestepans. At the same time he transferred to Mr. Bolton of Soho his entire interest in Watt's steam engine, the value of which, by the way, was thought so small that it was not even included among his assets. Roebuck's creditors not estimating it as worth one farthing. Watt sincerely deplored his partner's misfortunes, but could not help him. "'He has been a most sincere and generous friend,' said Watt, "'and is a truly worthy man.' And again, "'My heart bleeds for him, but I can do nothing to help him. I have stuck by him till I have much hurt myself. I can do so no longer. My family calls for my care to provide for them.' The later years of Dr. Roebuck's life were spent in comparative obscurity, and he died in 1794, in his seventy-sixth year. He lived to witness the success of the steam engine, the opening up of the Boristoness coal, and the rapid extension of the Scotch iron trade, though he shared in the prosperity of neither of those branches of industry. He had been working ahead of his age, and he suffered for it. He fell in the breach at the critical moment, and more fortunate men marched over his body into the fortress which his enterprise and valour had mainly contributed to win. Before his great undertaking of the Caron works, Scotland was entirely dependent upon other countries for its supply of iron. In 1760, the first year of its operation, the whole produce was 1,500 tonnes. In the course of time, other iron works were erected at Clyde Clough, Muirkirk and Devon, the managers and overseers of which, as well as the workmen, had mostly received their training and experience at Carron, until at length the iron trade of Scotland has assumed such a magnitude that its manufacturers are enabled to export to England and other countries 
upwards of 500,000 tons a year. How different this state of things from the time when raids were made across the border for the purpose of obtaining a store of iron plunder to be carried back into Scotland. The extraordinary expansion of the Scotch iron trade of late years has been mainly due to the discovery by David Mushet of the Black Band Ironstone in 1801, and the invention of the Hot Blast by James Beaumont Nielsen in 1828. David Mushet was born at Dalkeith near Edinburgh in 1772. Like other members of his family, he was brought up to metal founding. At the age of nineteen, he joined the staff of the Clyde Iron Works near Glasgow, at a time when the company had only two blast furnaces at work. The office of accountant, which he held, precluded him from taking any part in the manufacturing operations of the concern. But being of a speculative and ingenious turn of mind, the remarkable conversions which iron underwent in the process of manufacture very shortly began to occupy his attention. The subject was much discussed by the young men about the works, and they frequently had occasion to refer to Fouleroy's well-known book for the purpose of determining various questions of difference which arose among them in the course of their inquiries. The book was, however, in many respects indecisive and unsatisfactory, and in 1793, when a reduction took place in the company's staff, and David Mushet was left nearly the sole occupant of his office, he determined to study the subject for himself experimentally, and in the first place to acquire a thorough knowledge of assaying as the true key to the whole art of iron-making. He first set up his crucible upon the bridge of the reverberatory furnace used for melting pig-iron, and filled it with a mixture carefully compounded according to the formula of the books but notwithstanding the shelter of a brick placed before it to break the action of the flame, the crucible generally split in two, and not unfrequently melted and disappeared altogether. To obtain better results, if possible, he next had recourse to the ordinary smith's fire, carrying on his experiments in the evenings after office hours. He set his crucible upon the fire on a piece of fire-brick, opposite the nozzle of the bellows, covering the hole with coke and then exciting the flame by blowing. This mode of operating produced somewhat better results, but still neither the iron nor the cinder obtained resembled the pig or scoria of the blast furnace, which it was his ambition to imitate. From the irregularity of the results and the frequent failure of his crucibles, he came to the conclusion that either his furnace or his mode of fluxing was at fault, and he looked about him for a more convenient means of pursuing his experiments. A small square furnace had been erected in the works for the purpose of heating the rivets used for the repair of the steam-engine boilers. The furnace had for its chimney a cast-iron pipe six or seven inches in diameter and nine feet long. After a few trials with it, he raised the heat to such an extent that the lower end of the pipe was melted off, without producing any very satisfactory results on the experimental crucible, and his operations were again brought to a standstill. A chimney of brick having been substituted for the cast-iron pipe, he was, however, enabled to proceed with his trials. He continued to pursue his experiments in assaying for about two years, during which he had been working entirely after the methods described in books. But feeling the results still unsatisfactory, he determined to borrow no more from the books, but to work out a system of his own, which should ensure results similar to those produced at the blast furnace. This he eventually succeeded in effecting by numerous experiments performed in the night, as his time was fully occupied by his office duties during the day. At length these patient experiments bore their due fruits. David Mushet became the most skilled assayer at the works, and when a difficulty occurred in smelting a quantity of new ironstone which had been contracted for, the manager himself resorted to the bookkeeper for advice and information and the skill and experience which he had gathered during his nightly labours enabled him readily and satisfactorily to resolve the difficulty and suggest a suitable remedy. His reward for this achievement was the permission, which was immediately granted to him by the manager, to make use of his own assay furnace, in which he thenceforward continued his investigations at the same time that he instructed the manager's son in the art of assaying. This additional experience proved of great benefit to him, 
and he continued to prosecute his inquiries with much zeal, sometimes devoting entire nights to experiments in assaying, roasting and cementing iron ores and ironstone, decarbonating cast iron for steel and bar iron, and various like operations. His general practice, however, at that time, was to retire between two and three o'clock in the morning, leaving directions with the engine man to call him at half-past five, so as to be present in the office at six. But these praiseworthy experiments were brought to a sudden end, as thus described by himself. In the midst of my career of investigation, says he, and without a cause being assigned, I was stopped short. My furnaces, at the order of the manager, were pulled in pieces, and an edict was passed that they should never be erected again. Thus terminated my researches at the Clyde Iron Works. It happened at a time when I was interested, and I had been two years previously occupied, in an attempt to convert cast iron into steel without fusion by the process of cementation, which had for its object the dispersion or absorption of the superfluous carbon contained in the cast iron, an object which at that time appeared to me of so great importance that with the consent of a friend erected an assaying and cementing furnace at the distance of about two miles from the Clyde Works. Thither I repaired at night, and sometimes at the breakfast and dinner hours during the day. This plan of operation was persevered in for the whole of one summer, but was found too uncertain and laborious to be continued. At the latter end of the year 1798, I left my chambers and removed from the Clyde Works to the distance of about a mile, where I constructed several furnaces for assaying and cementing, capable of exciting a greater temperature than any to which I had before had access. And thus, for nearly two years, I continued to carry on my investigations connected with iron and the alloys of the metals. Though operating in a retired manner, and holding little communication with others, my views and opinions upon the rationale of iron-making spread over the establishment. I was considered forward in affecting to see and explain matters in a different way from others who were much my seniors, and who were content to be satisfied with old methods of explanation, or with no explanation at all. Notwithstanding these early reproaches, I have lived to see the nomenclature of my youth furnish a vocabulary of terms in the art of iron-making, which is used by many of the iron-masters of the present day with freedom and effect in communicating with each other on the subject of their respective manufactures. Prejudices seldom outlive the generation to which they belong when opposed by a more rational system of explanation. In this respect, time, as my Lord Bacon says, is the greatest of all innovators. In a similar manner, time operated in my favour in respect of the black band ironstone, the discovery of this was made in 1801, when I was engaged in erecting for myself and partners the Calder Iron Works. Great prejudice was excited against me by the ironmasters and others of that day, in presuming to class the wild coals of the country, as Black Band was called, with ironstone fit and proper for the blast furnace. Yet that discovery has elevated Scotland to a considerable rank among the iron-making nations of Europe with resources still in store that may be considered inexhaustible. But such are the consolatory effects of time, that the discoverer of 1801 is no longer considered the intrusive visionary of the laboratory, but the acknowledged benefactor of his country at large, and particularly of an extensive class of coal and mine proprietors and iron masters, who have derived, and are still deriving, great wealth from this important discovery, and who, in the spirit of grateful acknowledgment, have pronounced it worthy of a crown of gold, or a monumental record on the spot where the discovery was first made. At an advanced period of life, such considerations are soothing and satisfactory. Many, under similar circumstances, have not, in their own lifetime, had that measure of justice awarded to them by thy country, to which they were equally entitled. I accept it, however, as a boon justly due to me and as an equivalent in some degree for that laborious course of investigations which I had prescribed for myself, and which, in early life, was carried on under circumstances of personal exposure and inconvenience, which nothing but a frame of iron could have supported. They atone also, in part, for that disappointment sustained in early life by the speculative habits of one partner, and the constitutional nervousness of another, 
which eventually occasioned my separation from the Calder ironworks, and lost me the possession of extensive tracts of black band ironstone, which I had secured while the value of the discovery was known only to myself. Mr. Mushet published the results of his laborious investigations in a series of papers in the Philosophical Magazine, afterwards reprinted in a collected form in 1840, under the title of Papers on Iron and Steel. These papers are among the most valuable original contributions to the literature of the iron manufacture that have yet been given to the world. They contain the germs of many inventions and discoveries in iron and steel, some of which were perfected by Mr. Mushet himself, while others were adopted and worked out by different experimenters. In 1798, some of the leading French chemists were endeavouring to prove by experiment that steel could be made by contact of the diamond with bar iron in the crucible, the carbon of the diamond being liberated and entering into combination with the iron, forming steel. In the animated controversy which occurred on the subject, Mr. Mushet's name was brought into considerable notice, one of the subjects of his published experiments having been the conversion of bar iron into steel in the crucible by contact with regulated proportions of charcoal. The experiments which he made in connection with this controversy, though in themselves unproductive of results, led to the important discovery by Mr. Mushet of the certain fusibility of malleable iron at a suitable temperature. Among other important results of Mr. Mushet's lifelong labours, the following may be summarily mentioned. The preparation of steel from bar iron by a direct process combining the iron with carbon, the discovery of the beneficial effects of oxide of manganese on iron and steel, the use of oxides of iron in the puddling furnace in various modes of appliance, the production of pig iron from the blast furnace, suitable for puddling, without the intervention of the refinery, and the application of the hot blast to anthracite coal in iron smelting. For the process of combining iron with carbon for the production of steel, Mr. Mushet took out a patent in November 1800, and many years after, when he had discovered the beneficial effects of oxide of manganese on steel, Mr. Josiah Heath founded upon it his celebrated patent for the making of cast steel, which had the effect of raising the annual production of that metal in Sheffield from 3,000 to 100,000 tons. His application of the hot blast to anthracite coal after a process invented by him and adopted by the Messrs. Hill of the Plymouth Iron Works, South Wales, had the effect of producing savings equal to about twenty thousand pounds a year at those works. And yet, strange to say, Mr. Mushet himself never received any consideration for his invention. The discovery of titanium by Mr. Mushet in the hearth of a blast furnace in 1794 would now be regarded as a mere isolated fact inasmuch as titanium was not placed in the list of recognised metals until Mr. Wollaston, many years later, ascertained its qualities. But in connection with the fact, it may be mentioned that Mr. Mushet's youngest son, Robert, reasoning on the peculiar circumstances of the discovery in question, of which ample record is left, has founded upon it his titanium process, which is expected by him eventually to supersede all other methods of manufacturing steel and to reduce very materially the cost of its production. While he lived, Mr. Mushet was a leading authority on all matters connected with iron and steel, and he contributed largely to the scientific works of his time. Besides his papers in the Philosophical Journal, he wrote the article Iron, for Napier's supplement to the Encyclopaedia Britannica, and the articles Blast Furnace and Blowing Machine for Rees's Cyclopaedia. The two latter articles had a considerable influence on the opposition to the intended tax upon iron in 1807, and were frequently referred to in the discussions on the subject in Parliament. Mr. Mushet died in 1847. End of chapter 8